Hello everyone. Welcome to another NP Academy lecture. Today we will talk about diagnosis and treatment of cellulitis and abscess. So we will talk about cellulitis and abscess. And we will discuss what is cellulitis and abscess is. So what it is, how you will diagnose them. So diagnosis the cause of cellulitis and abscess and its treatment we will keep it this in one section for a better understanding and at the end we will discuss some of the basics of incision and drainage and we will keep the discussion focused on the outpatient management the one that you will see all the time we will not talk about the inpatient management inpatient management or the cellulitis or abscess that is caused by animal bite or water exposure or the chronic diabetic ulcer these are little different so we will talk about it some other time not today so today we will talk about the most common condition so let's talk about it let's start with the first section what it is as you probably know cellulitis and abscess is the two most common skin infection so let's draw the structure of skin your skin has the outermost layer that is called epidermis underneath your epidermis is your dermis and below the dermis is your subcutaneous fat this is your subcutaneous layer and below the subcutaneous layer is your fascia so this is your fascia and then the last one is you have is a muscle so this is your muscle so this is the simple structure of uh, skin so let's let's label it so this is your epidermis this is your dermis this is your subcutaneous fat this is your fascia and this is your muscle what happened in the case of cellulitis and abscess is that any injury to skin allow the bacteria to enter inside the skin and some of the most common cause for the injury is your insect bite is the most common one or the other one the simple scratch or abrasion so that injury allow bacteria to enter inside the skin and this in, uh, this leads to the infection and the infection start in in the epidermis but usually it's run pretty deep so like it start in the epidermis and it runs through the dermis as well as in the subcutaneous layer so this is your simple cellulitis and patient will complain to you about that they will have a redness and the soiling and pain so this is your uh, simple uh, cellulitis abscess on the other hand leads to the accumulation of pus so they will have a pus accumulation usually in the dermis however in many situation this can also run pretty deep in the, in the subcutaneous layer and so they have this nodular appearance above the level of the skin and this abscess can have a usually surrounding cellulitis not always but most commonly they'll have a, some surrounding cellulitis so this is your cellulitis and abscess okay well how you will diagnose them how you make a diagnosis of it so diagnosis is, is a basically it's a clinical diagnosis diagnosis and let's talk about cellulitis first so as i was saying that you make the diagnosis based on the history and physical exam and there are three things that you want to know about the cellulitis cellulitis is it's a red hot and tender as you can see there's some redness to it it's warm to touch and it's painful 
Some of the other things that, that we should know about cellulitis that will help you to make an accurate diagnosis is that cellulitis is almost always unilateral. If you notice the bilateral presentation, this is usually not cellulitis, it's something else. And cellulitis will be painful, but there will not be any itching in the cellulitis. If the patient complains to you about itching, it's not cellulitis, it's something else. And cellulitis is more as an acute presentation. It's acute, it develop, it's like more the indolent course of development, develop over the course of, sorry, indolent. It develop over the course of few days, like two to three days. Cellulitis is not chronic. If somebody comes and tell you that they have this redness and soiling from last six months, it's usually it's not cellulitis in something else. It's, it's a, so cellulitis is acute, it's not chronic, and it develops over the course of few days. If something develops over the course of just a few hours, it's usually not cellulitis, it's something else. But these are some of the things that will help you to make an accurate diagnosis. How about imaging? Do you need an imaging? Usually not, but one of the imaging that will help you is your bedside ultrasound. And that is because one of the main reasons for treatment failure for cellulitis is the underlying abscess. So every now and then when you are in doubt, it's a good idea to do ultrasound mainly to rule out any underlying abscess. And in the typical cellulitis, on the bedside ultrasound, they will have something called cobble stoning pattern. So this is enough to make a diagnosis for cellulitis. Well, how about abscess? Abscess diagnosis is rather simple because they will have a nodule to it that is kind of raised above the level of the skin. Uh, it can have some pus sometime, pus that you can see. Uh, sometimes they will have this fluctuant that means abscess is ready to be drained. Sometimes they will have an induration like the hard mass and it may or may not have a surrounding cellulitis. And on, if you do the bedside ultrasound, you will notice the fluid collection, like dark appearance uh, on, the, on the ultrasound. Well, do we need any other imaging like CT? In few circumstances, you will need the CT to diagnose abscess. And when you do the CT, you want to do CT with IV contrast. And two of the most common time that you will need CT is when, when you are diagnosing when you have a perirectal abscess. Mainly because this area is very tricky and an abscess can go many places. So perirectal abscess or intraoral, especially if someone has like dental abscess and so on. Otherwise, you don't need a CT. Okay. Well, do we need a lab work? Generally speaking, you won't need a lab work when you are diagnosing or managing this condition on outpatient basis. However, if you want to admit the patient in that condition, you will need the lab work. So when do you want to admit the patient? What are the, some of the admission criteria? Well, if someone failed the outpatient treatment, then you will need to admit the patient if someone has a very extensive infection, extensive infection, if this infection is in nearby any prosthetic joint, so that will be the very tricky one. If uh, someone has uh, any sign of sepsis, like if someone has your fever, uh, tachycardia, hypotension, you may consider admitting then. Or there's some other condition like if someone has a uh, uncontrolled diabetes or like HIV or like on the chemo or someone has a history of IV drug use or uh, chronic alcohol abuse. In this condition, not everybody need to be admitted, but you may want to think about it or you may want to keep the low threshold of admitting this patient. 
if you do want to admit the patient in that case you do want to do some lab work and there you will draw the CBC they are looking for the elevated white blood cells uh, CRP this is your inflammatory marker that is usually elevated CMP you are looking for the electrolyte and kidney function if you are worried about the sepsis then you will draw the lactic acid and you want to draw the blood culture this is it this is the most common lab that you will need Okay, well, once you diagnose the, uh, this condition, now let's talk about the cause and the treatment of cellulitis and abscess. So, cause and treatment. And let's talk about cellulitis first. As I said, cellulitis will have a simple uh, redness and swelling and painful there will not be any sign of abscess in the case of cellulitis. So, when it comes to the cause of cellulitis, cause, cellulitis is your streptococcal disease. This is caused by group A streptococcus bacteria, the one that causes strep throat. That's the number one player in, uh, in the cellulitis. Your staph aureus, staph aureus does play a role in the cellulitis but this is going to be very little your strep is the number one player here so when you are developing the treatment you got to cover a strep that's the key here so treatment you got to cover a strep and not every antibiotic has a very good strep coverage for example doxycycline doxycycline or uh, your uh, bacterium these have a very good strep, co very good staph coverage, but these antibiotic does not have a very good strep coverage. So these are not the antibiotic of choice you want to use when you are treating the cellulitis. One of the most common and the most effective antibiotic that has been proven to work in terms of, in the case of uh, cellulitis is your Keflex. Keflex cover both strep and this also cover a staph, but it only cover methicillin sensitive Staphylococcus aureus, not the methicillin, not the MRSA. That's a wonderful drug that always work for cellulitis. And the dosing regimen is this: in case of adult, you will give them 500 milligram PO. In case of peds, you will give them 6.25 milligram per kilogram. And give them every six hours for five to seven days it used to be seven to ten days but the five to seven days uh, tend to work as effective as seven to ten days so this is the new guideline that works really great well what are the other option for the treatment the other option will be your clindamycin clindamycin clinda cover both it cover a strep and MRSA that cover both and the dosing regimen in the clindamycin is that in the case of adult you have 450 milligram in case of peds you have 10 milligram per kilogram and this is TID for 5 to 7 days. I do not like clindamycin mainly because of all the antibiotic Clinda has the highest chances for causing C. diff. So, I, rare, I rarely used it, use it. If I do use it though, I use it only for 5 days, mainly because I am always worried about the C. diff. But this is your another option. Back in the day, people used to treat cellulitis with two different antibiotics. They will give them Keflex to cover strep and they will give them either Bactrim or Doxycycline to cover MRSA. Well, they did a lot of research and the new research has shown that if you really make an accurate diagnosis of cellulitis and you rule out there is no sign of abscess whatsoever, Keflex itself is good enough. However, if you really worry about the MRSA, it's okay to add Doxy and Bactrim and it will be okay, you can always justify, but you really don't have to. But this is a treatment. Another important thing in the treatment is the patient education patient education and you want to educate the patient 
that once you start the antibiotic, symptom may get worse in the first 24 to 48 hours and after that they start to improve. So what happens is that when the patient come to you, people usually make a marking along the line of redness. And when you start the antibiotic, in first 24 to 48 hours, it's okay that there, 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 this redness may increase little bit. And the increase in redness around this border is mainly because when this antibiotic starts to kill bacteria, this bacteria uh, produces a toxin and that causes inflammation. So the redness can increase up to 20% in the first 24 to 48 hour and that is okay, that is not considered as a treatment failure. As long as patients are stable, they, their vital signs are stable, they don't have a fever or chill. Uh, on the other hand, if the next morning they wake up and this size become twice, then that's a treatment failure. But slight increase in redness is okay in within first 24 to 48 hours. The maximum is three days. They should be having improvement in 72 hours. If they are not having any improvement in 72 hours, then that will be considered treatment failure. So that's important to educate the patient. Okay, well, this was all about the cellulitis. Let's talk about abscess abscess so abscess and the, the first talk about the cause of abscess abscess is simple whenever you notice abscess we are talking about here MRSA we are talking about a staph A staphylococcus aureus and we are talking about MRSA it used to be that there are certain population who will be more uh, risk for getting MRSA and some will have only methicillin sensitive staphylococcus aureus but MRSA is so common in the community these days that abscess means MRSA it's very simple and when it comes to treatment for the abscess there are two aspects of it first is that you have to do incision and drainage and then you have to add the antibiotic before it used to be that, that the adequate incision and drainage should be enough but the new research has shown that adding the antibiotic does have some benefit. So first we will talk about antibiotic and then we will talk about IND at the last uh, section. So antibiotic here in the case of abscess we are trying to cover the MRSA hair. So the antibiotic of choice in this condition is uh, one of my most favorite antibiotic is my doxycycline. It's a wonderful drug. The dosing is 100 milligram BID for 5 to 7 days and if you get a really good incision and drainage 5 days is more than enough so I usually prescribe them for 5 days only thing to know about doxy is that it's a pregnancy category X so you don't want to give them to, to the pregnant female and no one under the age of 8 years mainly because it damages the teeth and it affects the bone growth other than that it's a wonderful drug the second option is your back trim, back trim, the double strength, DS. As you know, back trim has a TMP in it, trimethoprim plus sulfamethaxazole, sulfa, TMP, sulfa. And dosing is based, in the case of adult, it's based on the weight. So if uh, you are in the adult here, if uh, less than 120 kilogram, Sorry, here let me. Uh, if it's uh, less than 120 kilogram, then you will use one tablet. And if it's uh, more than 120 kilogram of body weight, then you give a two tablet. And in the peds, you give them five milligram per kilogram based on the TMP component. And again, you will give them for BID twice a day uh, for five to seven days. And this work also really great. Uh, something to know about back trim is that back trim is your pregnancy, uh, pregnancy category X. This is your pregnancy category X. So it's not a good idea to give them in pregnancy. The other option for the treatment is your uh, clindamycin clindamycin and the dosing is the same it's a 450 milligram in the adult 
and 10 milligram per kilogram in peats for three times a day for five to seven days. So these are the three options uh, for the treatment of um, choice for the antibiotic in the case of absence. So that's about antibiotic. Now let's talk about incision and drainage, IND, incision and drainage. Well, there are a few things to know about this. First of all, you want to know about the contraindication when you do not want to uh, do the incision and drainage. And these are your when they have a super large abscess, a huge abscess, very, very large abscess. You don't want to drain this one. If your abscess is around the perirectal area, so perirectal abscess, they need to go to OR. Hand abscess, other than peronychia, that can be very tricky. If the abscess is nearby your artery, like uh, on the neck, nearby carotid artery or femoral artery, you don't want to draw that. So these are some of the things that you want to either send, it to, send the patient to the specialist or the OR room. Other thing to know about is the needle aspiration. Do not do that, needle aspiration. This thing does not work. Only time this work is when you have a peritonsillar abscess. So, before you cut open the wound, it's a really good idea to do the bedside ultrasound. And the reason is that this will confirm your diagnosis. Every now and then you will be surprised that uh, you think there's an abscess, you cut it open and there's nothing in it. So then you give the patient a wound, so it's not a good idea. So do the bedside ultrasound. It will also tell you about the size of the abscess, the depth, how deep it is or if there's any tracking or any tunneling to it. So it gives you a lot of information. Then you want to do the very good pain control because one of the main reason for the treatment failure in the abscess is the inadequate drainage and that's mainly because of the lot of pain. So give them something for pain. Let's draw the structure of abscess here. So say for example, uh, this is your skin and this is your abscess. So under the pain control, another thing that you want to do, it's a good idea to do, is to use the let. Use the, the let. Let and wait it for at least 20 to 30 minutes. That will give you some level of pain control. Then you want to use the local anesthesia, like either 1 to 2 percent, either or lidocaine with epinephrine with epinephrine it gave a better anesthesia and it also lasts longer epinephrine so where you want to inject the epinephrine and back in the day it used to be that sometimes people will do the ring block like they will inject uh, epinephrine here and here turn out that that does not work very well so the standard of practice these days is so you get the needle and you find the juiciest area, say for example this is your juiciest area and then you get the needle uh, in the parallel to the skin and have the bevel facing you and the moment skin, uh, the needle go underneath the skin, that's where you want to inject the lidocaine. It makes a nice circular wheel, that's what you want. There's absolutely no reason to come in the abscess cavity to inject the lidocaine because this will not give you anything. It has to be right underneath the skin. And once you make uh, inject the lidocaine, then, the, then you want to use uh, the blade number 11 because of the specific shape of it. And you want to make a full length incision that follow the skin fold. That will give you less scarring and you want to make a full length incision. If you make a, small in, a smaller incision, then you will get a kind of inadequate drainage and that's not good. So full length incision. Once you do that, you need to know that these abscess here, it is not a one big pocket of abscess. Abscess inside here is a small little pocket that's called locule. The form is a small little locule. So once you uh, make the incision, then you want to use the hemostat like Kerf Kelly hemostat 
to break this locules you want to uh, break this locule called something called delocalization and once you delocalize it then you want to express the abscess then the last will express the abscess as much as you can and then you of course you want to uh, obtain the culture obtain the culture well how about irrigation irrigation used to be common standard of practice but the new research has shown that irrigation tend to be not very effective so if it's a small abscess you really don't have to irrigate them if it's really a large abscess it's okay to irrigate them however if you don't want to irrigate with the normal saline it's okay too how about packing packing is the same thing back in the day packing was the standard of care but now the new research has shown that packing does not help much either however packing is recommended if the abscess is more than 5 cm if someone is that diabetic or immunodeficient like diabetic or hiv or if it's a pilonidal abscess pilonidal abscess so why do we pack it there are two benefits of packing first of all you use the idoform gauge to pack the wound and you just start packing it like this and you have a little bit of uh, wick coming out so packing has two benefits first of all it keeps the wound open and so it, it helps to better drain it also allow wound to heal from inside out as a secondary intention and once you pack the wound then you want to reassess the patient in 24 to 48 hours and you are looking for drainage if there are still if there are no drainage then you stop packing if you are still there draining if draining is a yes then you repack it however when you repack it you will notice that you will need the less packing material this time mainly because the wound is healing inside out so if you repack it then you have to again in 24 to 48 hour they have to be evaluated and if it is stop draining then, then you notice no draining then you don't have to pack it then no packing once the draining is stopped then packing is stopped no packing okay how about the wound management once you pack the wound you want to first of all you use the absorbent dressing absorbent dressing because the idea is that it will absorb the, all the abscess and when the patient go home once the packing is uh, stop if you pack it however if you don't pack it then right away the same day they want to soak the wound soak wound in warm and soapy water soapy water or use the warm compress warm compress several times a day three four times a day three to four times per day until wound heal and usually uh, wound heal it takes up to seven to ten days seven to ten days and then you want to follow up in seven to ten days so this is all about abscess and of course you do want to make sure that you update the patient uh, tetanus vaccine because you cut open the wound so this is all about abscess and this is all about cellulitis and abscess hopefully you will find it useful thank you very much and i will see you next time